usury, interests, and charity. The prohibition against usury as it appears in the Mosaic Law refers specifically to the brother who is poor. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor, Exodus chapter 22 verse 25, and if thy brother be waxen poor, Leviticus chapter 25 verse 35, it was legitimate to take a return above the sum lent from the religious stranger, Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 20. A tenth of this increase would therefore be tithed to God, thereby extracting from the unregenerate at least a portion of the tithe that all men owe to God. As a slave to sin, the stranger was not protected from the bondage imposed on a poor man by every usurious contract. But to the poor Hebrew brother, his lending brother was to show mercy. No increase of any kind beyond the original money or goods could be legitimately claimed by the creditor. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 37 Historically, these restrictions were not acknowledged as binding by the Hebrew commonwealth. The continual violations of all aspects of the Mosaic law brought condemnation on the nation. God had not left them without warning. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments, to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. He that hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 8 and 9 and verse 13. The definition of usury is precise biblically. Any increase taken from the poor in return for having made a loan. There is no biblical evidence, nor have Christian casuists generally argued, that the prohibition restricted interest received on business loans so long as a lender shared the risks of failure along with the borrower. This interpretation of the usury prohibition was basic to the expositions of medieval and early Protestant casuists. By sharing in the risk of a profit-making business, a lender has the right to participate in a portion of the returns. The problem for the casuists came only when the lender was guaranteed a return on his investment irrespective of the success or failure of the enterprise. The prohibition of usury, as it appears in the Bible, is simultaneously coupled with a requirement that godly men lend to all brethren in truly dire circumstances. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 7 following. This requirement, if it were universally respected, would have a definite impact on the illicit, immoral usury market. People in emergencies would have access to more money and goods than they would have been able to gain access to had the requirement to lend never been given by God. Christians with extra funds are brought into the emergency loan market apart from an economic incentive. With more funds available, the demands of desperate borrowers can be met more readily. Thus, the prevailing rate of return on the usury market is forced lower. Those receiving the charitable loans have no need to enter the usury market, and their presence does not therefore raise rates in that illicit market. They are not bidding up the usury rate because their needs are being met outside of that market. It must be stressed, however, that the kind of emergency described by the relevant passages is a true emergency. 
It arises when a poor man has nothing left but his cloak, and even that may be legitimately demanded as collateral in the daytime, thus keeping the debtor from using the collateral to secure multiple loans. The emergency is a situation of desperation. Godly men and women are not to indebt themselves for anything less than this. Owe no man anything but to love one another is the binding rule for all non-emergency circumstances. Romans chapter 13, verse 8a. Charity loans were required of affluent believers. Consumer loans at no interest were not contemplated. No one was supposed to ask for them, so there was no requirement to provide them at zero return. It was assumed that consumer loans were products of a slave mentality. From the ethical slave, the stranger, it was legitimate to take interest. Those who did not regard themselves as slaves were, and are, expected to heed the words of Solomon. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Operationally, the rate of interest, like all prices, is a product of supply and demand. In a non-monetary economy, it would reflect the supply and demand for goods and services. The presence of money confuses the picture somewhat by adding another factor to the equation. The supply of and demand for money. The fact that these two aspects are present in this single rate of interest can lead to highly concrete practical problems, namely the boom-bust cycle of inflation depression. For the purposes of this essay, it is not necessary to pursue this dualistic aspect of the interest rate. The problem here is simpler. Why is it that people expect to gain a return above the capital loaned and why are others willing to pay it? This highly theoretical problem baffled economists for centuries. Professional economists are not yet completely agreed in the subject, but in the last hundred years, a general solution has appeared. A man can claim a rate of return on his money or goods loaned out for three reasons. First, because he forfeits the use of the money for a given period of time. This is the so-called time preference factor, also called the originary rate of interest. The use of a good right now is more valuable to a person than the promise of the use of that good at a later time, assuming that tastes do not change, of course. Every rational person discounts the value of future economic goods. Men are mortal. They are subject to the burden of time. Each man places a premium on the use of his wealth over time. He will not voluntarily forfeit that use without compensation. His personal time preference sets his discount rate for the enjoyment of future goods and services that his money might buy immediately. That rate of discount sets the rate of interest that he will demand from someone who wants to borrow his money. Because money is more highly valued now than the same amount of future money is valued now, assuming a stable purchasing power for money, some men are willing to pay to get access to money now. A future-oriented society will display a lower rate of interest. Such men do not value the present that much in terms of the future. As a result, the price spread between present money and future money is narrowed. Here is one possible avenue of investigation open for anyone interested in explaining the rapid rates of growth experienced in the past century by the West, and especially the Protestant West. A future-oriented culture produces lower rates of interest, 
making it easier for capitalist entrepreneurs to gain access to funds for economic development. The second component of the rate of interest is the risk premium. The lender knows that he may not get his money back. The borrower may go bankrupt, or he may run away with the loan. To compensate the lender for its risk, a factor which can be estimated with some accuracy by modern statistical techniques, he demands a payment above and beyond his time preference return. Naturally, in a culture which honours the creditor's claim, the risk premium will be lower. Morality does influence the rate of interest. A society that takes seriously the psalmist's warning with respect to both borrowing and lending will find a godly, easy money policy and not a Keynesian, inflationary one. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Psalm 37, verse 21 The merciful lender, as we have already seen, helps to keep the illicit usury rate down, and the honest borrower in a business helps to keep the risk premium lower. Christian nations that are not seduced by antinomianism should produce a smaller black market for loans, emergency, usurious loans, and a lower interest rate for commercial loans. The third factor is the inflation premium. A lender wants to be paid back in money that will purchase as many goods as the money he lent. In an inflationary society, the lender will add a new demand, enough money to compensate him for the expected fall in the value of the nation's circulating media. Again, if a society honours Isaiah's condemnation of debased precious metals used by ancient kingdoms as money, and if it also honours the Mosaic law against multiple indebtedness, thus stifling the inflation produced by modern fractional reserve banking, it will not experience much price inflation. In fact, an expanding economy, given a relatively fixed money supply, will produce a gradually falling price level. It could fall enough to lower the money rate of interest, though not the actual rate of interest in terms of purchasing power. A society could conceivably produce a negative money rate of interest if the value of the purchasing power of money were rising at a faster rate than the market's registered rate of time preference plus the risk premium. If you could buy more with the money received in the future, you might need to ask only for an equal amount of paper money or coins as a return. With this as background to the theory of the interest rate, it should be easier to grasp the implications of the charitable loan that comes under the usury prohibition. The lender faces a sure loss on his loan. First, he bears the risks associated with loans to the impoverished, where he can ask no extra payment as a risk premium attached to the rate of interest. Second, he receives back goods in the future, but future goods are less valuable to a man than the same goods in the present. He therefore forfeits the use of his goods over time without any compensation. He receives back less valuable goods, for he has lost the one thing that creatures cannot restore, time. Third, during inflationary times, he also forfeits the lost purchasing power if his loan is won in terms of paper money, as it would normally be. He therefore bears two, and possibly three, costs of the loan. That is the extent of his charity. He suffers a loss for the sake of his needy brother. This loss is required of him by God 